For the second section of our roundtable, we are, it's our big privilege to have Mr. Kingsley Ng, Program Director of the Bachelor of Arts and Science in Arts and Technology at Hong Kong Baptist University. He is going to moderate our talks on rethinking the age of digital transformation. Mr. Ng is an interdisciplinary artist and designer with a focus on site-specific and participatory projects. His works have been featured in notable exhibitions and venues worldwide. And we are thrilled that Mr. Ng can join us online today. May we give him a big round of applause. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Ng. So let us welcome the first speaker. For the first speaker, when we talk about technology, it has always increasingly influenced artistic practice, audience engagement, the delivery of arts programs and services, and more than that ever before, a medium of, for artistic creations. For more on how technology is shaping the arts industry, it is with great honor for us to invite our first speaker, Mrs. Rosa Daniel, Chief Executive Officer of the National Arts Council in Singapore, and serves on the boards of Esplanade and National Gallery of Singapore. She also oversees the Ministry Culture Acad Academy as Dean. In July 2022, she was appointed Singapore's ambassador to the United Nations Education, Science and Cultural Organizations, UNESCO. May we now again invite Mrs. Daniel to come to the stage. Mrs. Daniel, good afternoon. A very good afternoon and uh, it's really a great pleasure for me to be here physically. And of course, I must begin by thanking the Hong Kong ADC, my dear colleagues, uh, Winsome, and of course the chairman uh, for kindly inviting me to be here again uh, and in person. Um, I think I've got the pleasure now to kind of like uh, move uh, into another track and that's about technology. This is the panel on digital transformation and rethinking that. Uh, so I, I'm going to speak about uh, what's been happening in Singapore and how we rethink uh, technology, innovation, and the arts. Uh, actually, we began this uh, quite some time ago. So it is to us a journey, and uh, we are progressing along a journey which we embarked on quite rigorously, I would say about five, at least five years ago. Uh, can I move the slide, please? Actually, we had started uh, uh, around about 2018 uh, in the last arts plan, which is, this is our five-year blueprint. We had put technology front and center among the strategic priorities that we should embark on with the National Arts Council leading the sector to think in this way. At that time, of course, we had thought about uh, technology being applied to new ways of arts creation and arts expression, also ways in which you can engage the audiences. Well, fast forward, well, it was a good thing that we had begun that. Uh, we had also thought about uh, what Stephen talked about, which was how um, technology could help our self-employed persons or SEPs, the freelancers. Uh, we thought technology is a very good way to reach out to a very fragmented uh, individual community as a way to engage them and also to keep them in touch with what was happening. Uh, th those were the things we thought about. And then along came COVID. And I think it would be fair to say that it simply accelerated for us uh, the journey that we had already embarked on. Uh, actually, I was looking at the Hong Kong figures and I think we are fairly similar uh, because we had rolled out a relief package, which is I think the equivalent of about 380 million Hong Kong dollars, of which uh, at least 150 million of that was really channeled eventually to digitalization. I mean, by necessity, right? Because uh, during uh, the years 2020 and 2021, uh, much of the arts activities and uh, uh, work was really done online. And so we saw uh, a huge uh, amount of uh, supply of the arts that came on stream. And at the start of it, I think what mattered to us was that everyone just went online and, and tried. Uh, of course, uh, we, we always aim for high quality. Uh, so it was patchy. I'm sure uh, many of us experienced that. It was uh, something that we had to build capabilities on. We were not so fussed up about uh, quality to begin with. We just wanted everyone to try from the Biggest arts groups, the most capable to the ones who had just done it for the first time. And I think it was a good wake-up call. There are some good things that came out of COVID. We pivoted fast, and one of the things that we, we were able to do was to convince a very receptive crowd that not only must you digitalize, you must also learn, upskill into new competencies. So we were very happy that there were about 2,300 uh, digitalization projects that were spun off during this period. 
And we created more than 18,000 jobs. And we had a lot of people who also signed up for training. So some good things came out from that. So fast forward uh, in the next slide. Uh, now that we are uh, looking ahead, uh, in our next blueprints, which is just uh, right now in the final phases of public consultation, covering the years 2023 to 27, uh, we're going to carry on this journey. In this arts plan, we see the arts as uh, really driving three key, key pillars for Singapore. Uh, we believe that the arts is integral to how you would build a connected society, uh, bringing people together. And many of you who are friends of Singapore will know that uh, we do have a rather complex uh, social fabric. We are multicultural and we are also a, 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 a country that has a, a local born, also many newcomers. So a connected society enabled by the arts. A distinctive city because we think that the arts, like in, in Hong Kong, uh, can make the city beautiful through uh, the way that it expresses our cultural identity, our heritage, uh, through uh, places and spaces. And last but not least, of course, a creative economy. Because uh, as we go forward, the arts allow uh, our young people to think differently. It allows the arts to come together with design, uh, with other sectors. Now, in all of this, we believe that technology and innovation must surely undergird uh, the three pillars. So we see this as still a front and center of the work that we're going to do in the years ahead. Uh, if I can just share, because we're in the Arts Council, we also believe that, uh, I think that uh, you can see it better there, that actually at the end of the day, we still believe that it's still about artistic excellence and audience engagement, right? It's a uh, uh, it still must be fundamental to all the work that we do, the ultimate objectives of uh, um, raising artistic or supporting artistic excellence, as well as growing and engaging audiences. So that's still something that is our North Star. But we are using technology to better do both. So let me share a bit about uh, what we've been up to. On artistic excellence, we absolutely have seen artists um, grow new capabilities, and I've heard the words resilience, innovation in the earlier panel as well. Certainly, we saw that in Singapore. Uh, I think they've become a lot more multidisciplinary. We've seen that. Uh, technology has made that possible for the visual arts, the performing arts, the literary arts to come together. Uh, we see that, uh, I think there was some discussion yesterday. Uh, some of us who were at the cultural forums uh, heard my minister talk about how probably technology adds extra complexity to how we must also protect the intellectual property rights of our, of our artists. Part of the artistic excellence, and, and I think artists are not so well placed, and so in the Arts Council, we have to sometimes help protect their rights. They, they create art, and they're very passionate about it, but sometimes they're not so aware of how they need to protect uh, their, their, their creative uh, endeavours. And we believe that as they, they embark on digital arts, maybe that's another track we have to think a lot deeper about. Of course, there are, there are um, developments like blockchain and so on that have some natural protection. But nonetheless, we have to look into the legislation. And as importantly, probably even before you get there, for artists themselves to be aware of the, of the needs. And so that, again, is about capacity building. Uh, I can go on uh, and talk about, about that, but let me just move on in the interest of time. Uh, on capacity, I talked about capability development. Uh, we know that uh, we too in Singapore have got this phenomenon of a growing gig workforce. And uh, we will continue. I talked about how in the last few years, we've actually been very purposeful about uh, capability development training courses and um, helping them to have uh, resources at their fingertips. Technology, uh, will be, again, front and centre of what we do. We're going to make sure that uh, they continue to, in their, in their journey to pick up new competencies. I've got some figures there, but it gives you a sense of the, the magnitude of the, the projects that we've been embarking on. Um, we find that, uh, um, in the next slide, please. Um, we also know that in the arts sector, we can't hope to do everything. So uh, we had uh, some years ago already begun the first phase of the arts folks working together with tech partners. I won't go too much into this, but we have many projects where we have simply put out the statement, the challenge statement, and we've asked the tech partners to respond to us. And I'm happy to say that we have so many projects now that come up with amazing ideas. And tech partners want to join us because I think they also see possible business uh, outcomes from that. So uh, it's about commercializing the arts as well. So tech partners know what to do. Uh, arts folks know what they do best. So actually in the Arts Council, we try to marry that through uh, Art and Tech Lab. 
uh, very quickly moving on in the interest of time. And I'd love to come back to some of the projects to share with you if you have interest. I want to talk about the dimension of audience engagement. And here you have some of the numbers put out. So it is certainly true that we have experienced the same thing that Paul talked about, which is that post-pandemic, uh, the supply of the arts has come back up. because, And we're so happy to support that because uh, there's this exuberance, this enthusiasm coming out of COVID to really supply uh, for the supply of the arts. But audiences is still about 20 to 30 percent uh, under capacity uh, compared to pre-COVID times. And in speaking to my friends from many jurisdictions, I think we're all fall, uh, uh, having the same issues for a variety of reasons, you know, change consumer behaviors and so on. But some bright uh, bright uh, sparks in the, in the horizon, which is that we have found in our consumption survey, we've been doing digital consumption surveys uh, quite regularly. So I think we've already got a third study. And we have found that actually behaviors have changed with digital engagement. So we're trying to understand better what is the meaning of digital engagement. And we're very happy to note that actually when we survey, people are ready to pay for digital arts as well. So there is some potential there as well. It's not all is lost. And we also believe that in, in surveying them, we think that uh, the arts could be richer if you had both the digital as well as the, the analog or the, or the traditional dimensions. And if both came together, I think you, you have new experiences and especially uh, it's powerful to engage the young because even if we don't change, our young audiences have got different needs and different sorts of um, uh, aspirations and behaviours. I want to move on, maybe that, I think that's the, my last slide, if I can just move on to the last part. Uh, I won't belabor the point because I think we've done in Singapore much of what you've seen in the earlier panel. Obviously, we've moved online. Festivals are delivered in a different way. Uh, we've also gone into engaging in the visual arts, uh, engaging new buyers on digital, uh, online auctions, on, on NFT exhibitions and sales and so on and so forth. I mean, the, 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 the way in which we have been engaging different parts of the arts ecosystem has really quite transformed, as we have seen in the last few years. Uh, the last, I think I have one final slide, and that is that uh, we understand now that uh, whether or not it is... Uh, 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 going to go back to old days, we think technology has new possibilities for us to understand our customer segments. It allows us to gather data in a manner that we never could before. And certainly, I think uh, we will want to be able to uh, find new ways to engage them and even cross market. So we understand now that uh, if you go to, for instance, if you are a family, your needs are very different from if you're a very busy professional or if you're a very active retiree. And I think technology allows us to reach out to them and more importantly, to also gather data, analyze that and better serve our, our consumers, our audiences. Uh, that's all I have time for. So I just come back to this final landing, which is that Technology actually undergirds what we do, but I guess fundamentally it's still about audiences and about our artists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Daniel and Rosa. Thank you so much. So we have more insight on how artists are experiencing with innovative technology, ranging from extended reality, XR, 5G technology, to artificial intelligence, AI. Not only the artists, but the audience as well. So please give a warm welcome to another speaker now. May we have Ms. Lee Hoon Hee, Director General at Business Innovations Division in Art Council Korea. Ms. Lee is responsible for the program of International Exchange Art and Technology and Business Strategy. I'm happy to see what she's going to share with us. Ms. Lee, please. 네. 어, 안녕하십니까. 방금 소개받은 한국문화예술위원회 이윤이라고 합니다. 어, 홍콩 예술 발전국에서 개최한 리더십 라운드 테이블에 초청해 주셔서 감사합니다. 그리고 최근 디지털 시대로 빠르게 전환되고 있는 시기에 이제 저희 한국문화예술위원회에서 추진하고 있는 사업 그리고 정책들을 이렇게 여러 기관들과 함께 라운드 테이블에서 공유할 수 있게 되어 매우 기쁘게 생각합니다. 그러면 저희 그 예술 지원 정책의 재설계라는 네, 이 발제를 좀 시작을 하도록 하겠습니다. 어, 먼저 저희 기관 소개를 좀 하고 창작 환경의 변화 그리고 새로운 지원 정책의 설계 그리고 앞으로의 정책 방향 이렇게 해서 좀 설명을 드리도록 하겠습니다. 
네, 한국문화예술위원회는 문화예술진흥법에 근거해서 1973년에 설립했고 그 문화예술진흥기금이라는 재원을 바탕으로 다양한 문화예술활동을 지원하고 예술의 역할과 가치를 지지하는 한국의 대표적인 기관입니다. 어, 2022년 3,500억 원 예산을 가지고 예술가 단체들의 예술활동을 지원했고 이 외에도 예술극장, 미술관, 베니스 비엔날레 한국관 어, 이런 인력개발원 등 이런 어, 기관들을 직접 운영하면서 안정적인 창작 환경을 제공하고 국민의 문화 향유에도 기여를 하고 있습니다. 어, 먼저는 한국의 창작 환경의 변화에 대해서 좀 말씀을 드리도록 하겠습니다. 정책 환경 관련된 부분입니다. 그 4차 산업혁명에 대응해서 전담위원회가 설치가 됐고요. 그리고 이제 과학기술부라던가 산업자원부라던가 문화체육관광부 같은 관계부처가 협력해서 한국판 뉴딜 주요 정책을 2020년에 수립을 하게 됩니다. 어, 이 한국판 뉴딜 주요 정책의 주요 내용은 전 산업의 디지털 혁신을 위해서 데이터, 네트워크, AI 이런 생태계를 강화하고 디지털 융복합을 다양한 분야로 확산하자라는 그러한 내용들입니다. 문화예술 환경의 변화입니다. 사실 이 부분은 앞에서 여러 기관들, 여러 나라들과 좀 비슷한 상황일 것 같습니다. 그 코로나19로 인해서 예술계에서도 온라인 디지털 기술을 활용해서 비대면으로 창작하고 향유 유통 활동이 확산되고 있습니다. 그리고 그 확장 현실이라던가 이런 신기술을 접목한 예술 창작 시도가 활성화됐고 관객과의 상호작용하는 예술 활동이 증가하고 있습니다. 그 옆에 있는 내용들, 이미지들 중에 한 가지 정도는 토론 때좀 같이 보면서 이야기를 나눌 수 있을 것 같습니다. 네, 이런 그 지원 정책에 있어서 그래서 어, 변화되는 측면들을 좀 말씀을 드리도록 하겠습니다. 그 아까 싱가포르 쪽에서도 이제 2018년부터 시작을 하셨다고 하셨는데 한국문화예술위원회는 이제 17년에 사이버, 융복합 이런 키워드를 발굴을 했고 어, 무대 기술 그리고 온라인 중심의 사업을 좀 추진을 하게 됩니다. 그리고 이제 2020년에는 그 정책 환경 변화에서도 살펴보았듯이 그 4차 산업 혁명 이슈 그리고 코로나 19로 인해서 비대면을 기반으로 기술을 활용한 창작 활동 수요가 재폭 확대되게 됩니다. 이에 따라서 이제 문학, 시각, 공연 예술 등전 장르로 융복합 창작 지원을 확대하게 되었습니다. 그리고 2022년에는 급변하는 네, 이 부분입니다. 2022년에는 급변하는 디지털 기술을 활용하고 다양화된 인터넷 플랫폼의 변화를 반영해서 지원 사업을 좀 세분화하고 다각화해서 추진을 하고 있습니다. 그 2022년 새로, 새롭게 하는 것이 이제 메타버스 예술 활동 지원 그리고 예술 데이터 매칭 지원 사업을 저희가 어, 17억 원, 10억 원 가량의 예산을 가지고 올해 더 많은 사업들을 추진을 하게 됩니다. 다만 이제 저희가 이 사업들을 정책을 설계를 하면서 저희 예술위원회에서 관련 연구와 조사를 해보니 한두 가지 정도 기술 융복합 예술 활동의 제약을 발견할 수 있었습니다. 한 가지는 예술 고유의 특성이 현장성, 뭐 생동감 그리고 직접 소통에 대한 부분인데 이 부분에 대한 기술적으로 한계가 있다는 지점입니다. 그리고 두 번째는 초기에는 다수의 예술가가 보편적으로 기술을 활용하고 그렇게 하는 단계까지 어떤 간극이 존재한다는 지점입니다. 어, 그 지원 정책을 설계, 설계하면서 이제 저희가 한세 가지 정도의 목적을 세우게 됩니다. 한 가지는 기술을 통한 예술 영역과 가치의 확장 그리고 예술의 창의성 및 실험성을 확대한다. 그리고 두 번째는 예술과 기술이 협력할 수 있는 방법을 모색하고 관련 분야의 이해도를 제고한다. 세 번째는 신규 관객을 발굴하고 관객과 소통할 수 있는 새로운 방안을 제시한다. 이런 정책의 목적들을 가지고 사업을 설계를 했습니다. 다만 그 아까도 말씀드렸다시피 예술가들이 기술을 활용하는 데 어려움이 있기 때문에 이런 지원 방식을 좀 다변화하면서 이러한 어려움을 해소하기 위해 노력을 하고 있습니다. 
어, 일단 기술에 대한 진입장벽 완화 부분인데요. 그 하이테크에서부터 로우테크까지 모든 종류의 기술 융합에 대해서 분명한 지향점을 제시를 했습니다. 그리고 이제 아이디어 기획, 리서치, 워크숍 등 과정 지원을 하고 있고요. 그리고 데이터 서비스 같은 분야는 예술위가 저희 문화예술위원회가 검증된 기업을 선별해서 바우처 형식의 지원도 하고 있습니다. 어, 그리고 이제 기술 활용 때 예술가들이 처음에 초기에 투입하는 비용이 굉장히 많기 때문에 이 부분의 부담 완화를 위해서 대규모 지원 그리고 단연간 지원도 가능하도록 저희가 지원을 하고 있습니다. 그리고 이제 그 기술 관련 정보에 대한 예술 예술가들의 니즈가 굉장히 많았습니다. 그래서 이 부분 역시 그 정보를 공유하거나 그리고 공동 창작이나 온라인 같은 저작권 이슈에 대해서도 어, 교육이나 컨설팅을 제공을 하고 있습니다. 그리고 이제 선정된 사업에 관련돼서는 어, 아카이빙을 계속을 하고 있고요. 그리고 오픈 소스를 공개하고 있습니다. 그래서 이네 어, 너무 작긴 한데요. <웃음> 네, 웹사이트를 보시면은 관련된 그 지원 사업들의 메이킹 필름 같은 것들을 확인해 보실 수 있습니다. 어, 그 사실은 저희가 지원 정책의 성과라고 쓰긴 했지만 이 사업을 시작한 지 이제 3년 차 사업이고 아직 성과라고까지 말씀드리긴 좀 힘들지만 이제 예술위원회 입장에서는 여전히 투자를 하는 단계라고 생각을 합니다. 그리고 예술가들도 계속 뭐 실험하고 시도하는 단계이고요. 다만 이제 몇 가지 특징들을 좀 살펴볼 수 있는데 어 기술 융합을 통해서 어떤 공연이나 영상, 게임 등좀 장르 구분이 모호해졌다는 어, 그러한 지점입니다. 그리고 관객과의 상호작용이 굉장히 중요한 예술 활동이 증가하게 되었습니다. 그리고 이제 처음에는 그 대면 활동의 영상화, 어, 그 단순하게 이제 대면 활동을 영상화 시킨다든지 그 홍보용 영상 등이 많았는데 사업이 지속 때문에 따라서 온라인 매체의 특징을 반영한 새로운 예술 활동의 모델들이 나타나게 됩니다. 그리고 그 기술들도 처음에는 이제 몇 가지 좀 한정된 기술을 사용을 했었는데 나중에는 예술가 분들이 스스로 코딩도 하고 새로운 프로그램도 만들고 이렇게 조금 다양한 그런 기술들을 활용을 하게 됩니다. 네, 마지막입니다. 그 전반적인 그 예술 지원에 대한 그 정책 방향에 대해서 말씀드리고 마무리를 하려고 합니다. 어, 사실 이제 기술을 활용한 예술 지원 사업을 저희 예술위원회에서도 이제 특정, 특정해서 전담하는 부서가 있긴 합니다. 그런데 21년에 그 기관 전체적인 차원의 어떤 중기 정도의 전략이 필요하다고 판단을 하게 되었습니다. 그래서 이제 이 표를 보시면, 아이고야. 네, 그 단계별로 저희가 좀그 단계별로 이제 지원 체계를 만들고 각 단계에 가장 적합한 어떤 프로그램과 사업들을 좀 고민을 했었고요. 그래서 지금 2단계랑 3단계에 나와 있는 부분들은 이제 재정적인 지원이 조금 집중해서 하고 있는 부분이라서 그냥 넘어가고 저희가 1단계랑 4단계 부분에 대해서 좀 말씀을 드리겠습니다. 그 1단계 인력 양성 부분은 이제 예술가들과 기술 전문가들이 만났을 때 가장 많이 하셨던 이야기들은 사고 방식이 다르다. 그리고 언어가 다르다. 그래서 서로 이해하기 힘들다. 이런 말, 말씀들을 많이 하셔서, 어, 저희가 올해부터, 어, 아티스트, 프로듀서, 엔지니어. 이렇게 APE 캠프라고 하는 프로그램인데요. 이제 한 50여 명 정도가 같이, 어, 서로 그, 본인들의 활동을 소개하고 제안하고 이러한 프로그램을 오래 진행을 했는데 굉장히 반응이 좋았습니다. 그래서 어, 내년에도 또좀 확대해서 진행을 할 예정이고요. 어, 그리고 마지막은 이제 4단계 어, 이렇게 관객 개발하고 그 수익화를 하는 부분입니다. 이 부분은 뭐 아까 싱가폴 쪽에서도 말씀을 하셨지만 굉장히 어렵고 또 저희가 좀 계속해서 노력해야 될 부분이라고 생각을 합니다. 네, 이상으로 마치도록 하겠습니다. 감사합니다. Thank you so much. 감사합니다. Thank you. Thank you.
Ms. Lee, who shares his experience, she has been working at the Art Council career in charge of support programs for arts and cultures, including visual arts, performing arts, and public arts for more than 20 years. Thank you for your very valuable experiences. So here comes our third guest, Mr. Adrian Collects, Chief Executive Officer of the Australia Council for the Arts. Previously, Mr. Collette was held the position of Chief Executive of Opera Australia, Australia's largest performing arts company for 16 years. He also worked in the book publishing for a decade, including as Managing Director of Read Books Australia, also as Vice Principal Engagement at the University of Melbourne. His portfolio also includes the oversight of the university's museum, and galleries and its many cultural sector partnerships. May we now give a big hand to Mr. Adrian Collette. Welcome, Adrian. Thank you. Thank you indeed for your very warm welcome. I'm so sorry I can't be there in person, but needs must. There's a bit going on in this country on cultural policy at the moment. Um, it's customary, I'm happy to say, to acknowledge the First Nations lands uh, that we are on uh, in ceremonies such as this. And I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations uh, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and to my many First Nations colleagues at the Australia Council. Um, sincere thanks for asking me to be part of this panel, and I've been listening to my fellow panellists with real interest. Um, I have no slides. But I'm going to begin by taking you back to a time many of us would probably prefer to forget. Think about March 2020, in the early stages of the pandemic, when we needed to be physically distant, audiences in Australia and across the world were turning to arts and culture like never before to keep connected. What was previously an opportunity or an entertainment became a need and for some, an urgent necessity to stay connected. And we learned how in the digital age, the arts could be more accessible than ever. Creative workers and arts institutions, although the first and hardest financially impacted by COVID-19, turned to live streaming and digital broadcast to allow them to continue to present artistic content with an in-person audience. I was about to say, uh, without a live audience, but we have learned that online and virtual audiences are very, and sometimes disarmingly, live. Digitally enabled arts and culture sustained audiences throughout the pandemic. Preliminary findings from the Australia Council 2022 National Arts Participation Survey, which will be published early next year, show arts and creativity played several roles during the COVID-19 restrictions. Arts and creative experiences were a way to maintain social connection, to feed one's inner soul, to relieve stress, and of course, to do something meaningful. Our COVID-19 Audience Outlook Monitor research, which has been tracking the behaviour and attitudes of audiences since the early stages of the pandemic, highlights the trends in audience behaviours. It shows digital offerings made arts accessible to new audiences, including those with disability, those are, who are immunocompromised, and those without access for geographic or financial reasons. Digital events also provided access to a range of cultural experiences that otherwise would not have been possible. Many in the arts were able to innovate and expand their digital capabilities and find new ways to engage audiences, both locally and globally. Digital adaptation led to new ways of producing and experiencing arts, including digital arts offerings which directly supported the health and well-being of our communities. The Sydney Dance Company, for example, offered accessible online dance classes in their virtual studio and supported the health and well-being of those in lockdown, a very direct response to the very challenges of COVID at the time. The examples of the commercial advantages of digital adaptation during this time are also plentiful. Some in the arts developed new business models which were designed to put money directly into the hands of artists. 
the 2022 Darwin Aboriginal Art Fair, which was forced online due to COVID, generated over $4 million in direct sales of artworks. And these profits went directly to First Nations art centres and communities, some in the very remotest parts of Australia. And the Melbourne Digital Concert Hall, which is an online ticketed concert series launched in March 2020 to help professional musicians continue their craft and earn an income during COVID-19. In its first year, it raised one and a quarter million dollars, close to all of which went directly to artists. It's now gone international, enabling musicians and arts industry workers to earn over three million dollars in the last three years. Um, in the last year, sorry, since the pandemic struck. So there can be little doubt that the challenges of COVID inspired artistic innovation, as we have heard. While this shift has been accompanied by much discussion of transformation and the pivot to online, this trend was in fact already occurring, as we know, and was simply accelerated by the COVID-19 disruptions. Over the past two decades, our lives and ways we engage with the world have been profoundly altered by internet connected devices. The Australia Council's report in real life highlights the digital trends in arts and culture. Digital technologies now affect the way we consume and interact with arts and culture. It is increasingly difficult, it is increasingly difficult to separate online and offline activities and many engagement activities include elements of both. And these advancements have also enabled us to develop new business models, new models of engaging audiences, and, and have inspired artistic experimentation. Participatory media and the kinds of interactions made possible through smartphones, social media, has also democratized access to artistic circles that previously may have been limited to the well-connected or already affluent. Audiences can now play a central role in the very process of creative production. And while digital inclusion remains an issue, the relative access accessibility of digital technology has meant that many more people can make and distribute creative work, removing some of the barriers that once existed in the cultural sphere. This is more than the democratization of access. It is the democratization of production for better and for worse. And our creative industries are at the forefront of digital innovation and transformation. In Australia, creative organizations are taking advantage of digital adaptation and experimenting with new business models, but with each, but with each new opportunity and structural change come a host of new considerations and challenges which are mostly interconnected and I think very, very complex. One challenge is how to create sustainable business models for artists and arts organisations in the digital landscape. Business models have been developed to address economic challenges, but the question of income to artists persists. In, in a large proportion of people's minds, online still means free or low cost. In one of the great advantages of accessible technology, in theory, more people get the chance to participate. But our research shows that artists still struggle to receive adequate compensation for their creative work, which highlights the needs to ensure policy and regulatory settings keep pace with change. And to what extent, if at all, can regulatory settings be com compatible with the rapid advance of digital democratization? Another key challenge is around access and inclusion. We know digital technology provides the potential for a wider range of people to participate in creative activity. However, the internet is a rapidly involving, evolving global marketplace, and it is essential to keep pace with its evolutions in order to ensure equity of access. For example, digital technology has provided greater opportunities for people with disability to engage with the arts. However, we must ensure we build on this as audiences return to theatres and clubs by supporting investment in the delivery of cultural content and experiences in ways that are accessible, remembering that we're remembering what we have learned about the needs of our audience and the ways in which we deliver our work. We also know that digital access is unevenly distributed across all demographic groups, our geographic locations across Australia. I'm sure this is true of other places in the world. 
and we know there is a need to improve digital literacy to ensure everyone is able to access and benefit from creative participation online. Although the means of cultural production and distribution are more easily accessible in the digital age, the tools and infrastructure behind digital media are increasingly under the control of large multinational tech companies. This presents challenges to regulatory attempts to ensure local content remains discoverable so that Hong Kong audiences can find Hong Kong's digital artists and culture, or that Australian audiences can find Australia's arts and culture. We must consider the question, what kinds of participation are allowed or encouraged on digital platforms and by whom? What content is being privileged through the sorting mechanism of algorithms? And how can we ensure local content remains discoverable? Underpinning everything is the need for universal acknowledgement that artists create work that has value and that they should receive fair compensation for their work. The importance of this, I think, cannot be overstated. And to achieve such a measure, we need investment in digital skills training. We need targeted professional development initiatives to support smaller arts and cultural organisations so that they too can maximise the opportunities of the new digital hybrid and digital landscape. And we need to assess and rethink the mechanisms required to adapt to new models and enable all content to compete with overseas offerings here in Australia. The Australia Council is harnessing and supporting the sector to navigate this uncharted territory by ensuring the settings are right for digital acceleration within the sector. Guided by our digital cultural strategy, through rigorous research, we are keeping up to date with audience behaviours, attitudes, motivations, and barriers to digital creative engagement. We are also investing in and developing digital capabilities and digital literacy within the arts and cultural sector through programs such as our Digital Strategist in Residence program, also our Digital CEO Mentoring program, and our Digital Fellowship program delivered in partnership with Creative New Zealand. As we emerge from the pandemic, we now have a unique opportunity to rebuild and reimagine our cultural and creative industries and work towards a digitally enabled, thriving arts and cultural sector. In the words of Tandy Palmer Williams, the researcher who has undertaken most of our COVID-19 audience research, she says, online audiences want what offline audiences want. They want what humans want to engage and fulfill our social, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual needs. I look forward to hearing the insights of others here today as we harness digital possibilities to support thriving creative industries and transformative arts experiences for all. Thanks sincerely for listening. Thank you so much, Mr. Collette. That was indeed a very insightful sharing on how we can, besides rethinking, we may need to reimagine and rebuild uh, our sustainable business models, ensure greater inclusion and assets to everyone, especially to people of differences, artists of differences. And we're looking forward to have this panel discussion with all. And also, may I take this opportunity to remind you that uh, please have your simultaneous interpretation service selected for our panel discussions. And I would also like to remind our audience that you are highly encouraged to ask any question you may have for our speakers, no matter in the online, friends in the online, in the Q&A box or uh, on the spot, you can raise your hand anytime. So... Um, before uh, now, I would like to invite all our speakers to go on stage to get ready. May I take this chance to invite again uh, in the venue, Mrs. Rosa Daniel and Ms. Lee Yoon Hee to go on stage for discussion. Of course, we have Mr. Colette and Mr. Ng ready online. Welcome both of you. Welcome four of, four of you again. Hi, good, good. Evening, everybody. This is Kingsley, and thank you very much, Mrs. Rosa Daniel, Ms. Lee Yunhee, and Mr. Adrian Collette for such stimulating talk. So, apology, I cannot be here physically with you today, but in the spirit of our symposium topic, rethinking technologies and innovation, then in the arts, uh, I'll be moderating these discussions online. So, um, I do have 
many questions, but I will have to condense a little bit. And um, I would like to ask Ms. Lee first. Uh, in the slides, you have indicated this questions of unique artistic characteristics with art and technology. And especially, uh, thank you very much for not only outlining all the rosy pictures of art and technologies, but also the limitations of art tech integrations. So in this uh, regard, I was wondering if you can comment a little bit about that today with technologies, we suddenly have a lot of possibilities in artistic creations, but we are as art creators around the world using very similar tools like the same game engine, the same AI diffusion model, the same point cloud imaging system, the same projection mapping system all over the world. So I was wondering if you can share with us some projects from your region where the artistic expressions are not bounded by the aesthetics of these emerging technologies. Ah, uh, could please play the video clip. <laughs> ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、
Rosa, Rosa? Are, are you going to comment? Uh, no, I was going to ask Adrian to just uh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very, I'm very happy to leave it where it is. I think. Okay. <laughs> Okay, Rosa, you don't have much to add to this question as well, right? Okay, that, that, that's I think I'm blown away by that video. I think it did all the talking. A picture, a picture yes. tells a thousand words. Yes, yes, <laughs> that that was wonderful, absolutely. And I, I'm totally up for um, not not high tech all the time. Like for for instance, we have done the one of the projects with uh, installing camera obscura on tram. So. We don't necessarily well, need to. I guess to. this is the most important point. You know, that old Marshall McLuhan line, the medium is the message. Exactly. That that you're now finding what we used to call high, you know, only weeks or months ago, we called hybrid art forms emerging from physical theatre and digital theatre working together. And it's already gone more than hybrid. It wouldn't surprise me at all. I mean, I, I am still guilty of talking about digital as a distribution method rather than as an emerging art form. And I think that is probably the most exciting and challenging thing that in in months and years to come, we are going to get more and more sophisticated digital art forms interacting with traditional live art forms, which will take us into quite a different, quite a different place, I think. And indeed, it is true that it, uh, we can reread a lot of uh, Marshall McLuhan's thoughts. For instance, in the emerging years of uh, TV, he he was all for radio. How how um, the, the the talk about hot and cool media, where we uh, we construct much more of a better realities through our minds when we listen to radio, as opposed to everything is feeding us with uh, the visual. So. There's lots that we, we, we can rediscover as by rereading uh, Marshall McLuhan. Thank you very much, uh, Adrian, for, for this comment. So, okay, so move on to next question. Uh, I guess these are easier because I, I was very stimulated by the sharing from uh, Rosa and Adrian speaking about sustainable business models or new re revenue streams with arts and technologies. I, I wonder if there may be um, cases that you, you can share with us, more concrete cases where we can learn about like what kind of new sustainable business models is emerging. Perhaps Rosa? Um, sure, th thanks. Uh, so this one, I'll, I'll go first, Adrian. Um, I, I think uh, I spoke about uh, how I, for the artistic uh, community, it's very important for them to uh, learn to work with others. So uh, if they're going to be sustainable, uh, to bring out the artistic possibilities to the design world, to even engineering, to architecture. Those will be uh, ways in which uh, artistic input can actually enrich uh, other types of uh, creative uh, sectors. And I think there will be wider uh, possibilities for livelihoods and for monetizing, if you would like to call it that, uh, their artistic talents. Uh, but actually, it's not just about uh, the arts working with other sectors, uh, actually they also are able to uh, to use technology and innovation to bring down business costs. We've seen a lot of those projects where, uh, in fact, it's not like any other, uh, it's, it's no different from any enterprise. You still have to manage not just uh, revenue generation, but you also have to manage on the cost front. And I think this is uh, something which uh, the arts sector must think about in this world where uh, we must have sustainable resourcing. Uh, we must think about, you know, uh, environmental issues. This is something that even if we don't care about, the young care greatly about. So how can the arts sector actually uh, also leverage technology, for instance, to cut down, to share resources, put many things online, to uh, uh, adapt to uh, use uh, business solutions, which are a lot more efficient through technology, cut down the uh, wasteful uh, physical resources. I think these are all manner in which uh, uh, on the cost front they can manage. Uh, there are many projects 
subjects which have also, uh, maybe it's also um, uh, uh, addressed to the earlier point uh, that, that was asked. Uh, I think it ha also allows us uh, to cross within the arts itself, right? Uh, if the visual arts world is able to learn from best practices in the performing arts world and vice versa, I think there's a lot to be done. Sometimes in the arts uh, sector, we are very um, uh, guilty of looking at it in a very uh, sort of arts domain centric manner. But actually, there's a lot of good practices. So in, in Singapore, some of the uh, uh, arts companies that are m very much in the forefront. For instance, uh, our theatre companies were very good at coming together to raise uh, donations online. And it was quite interesting because they never did that before, but uh, it was almost like a game show, you know, they put things online and then people started donating online. That, that was quite nice to see. And of course, the visual arts world has started, of course, uh, for uh, gone on uh, online to, to buy and sell art. So these are uh, um, a different kind of domain uh, approaches. But uh, again, the cross-disciplinary thinking is made possible. And I think technology um, encourages us to break down those artificial barriers. I'll stop there. Okay, great. And Adrian? Yeah, thank you, Rose. That was terrific. I really agree with all that. I think lots of possibilities are emerging both to, both to um, contain costs and, and through what in the best sense we'd call commercial exploitation and working across different sectors. Um, the thing I worry about most, and it's not a worry, it's an excitement, but the thing I think, and I tried to point to it in the words I said, is just the creation and exploitation of in intellectual property. I think that's where digital technology takes us into a very, very different world. And the way artists can create and maintain their intellectual property in a rapidly, I use the word democratising, it might not be the right word, but I think you probably know what I'm getting at. Uh, I think the whole creation and exploitation of value has changed significantly. And I have no idea where this is going to land. You know, we'll all be very wise in five years' time. Let me give you a very simple example. You know, uh, I know quite a successful contemporary musician, you know, what we call in Australia a muso, who has released an album every year over the past decade, lived, lived off its royalties while he creates the next album. And it was quite a, quite a good business model. Here's someone who's very talented doing only new contemporary uh, new work and living off the proceeds of his album, he'd support it with the occasional live gig. And, you know, there, there are many artists like that. Uh, now his whole catalogue is part of Spotify. So that's completely crueled his business model. He's back on the road touring. That's the way he makes it. Nothing wrong with that. That's brilliant too. He's, very, he's a very good musician. But he's in a funny way, he's got to go. It's back to the future. He's gone back to touring to make a living as an original composing artist because the whole digital distribution through a service like Spotify, and I'm not for or against Spotify, it's just a reality, means the exploitation of IP created through that album is no longer as sustainable as it once was. So that's a, a kind of sobering example to show how it's not all just more audience, more access, more value. Often it's a much more complex relationship than that. And as a former publisher, I have a very high premium on the development and exploitation of individual artists, intellectual property. And I think we all have to think very hard about that. I could give you a dozen, and I gave some in my address, of successful sales generated for artists and the money went directly back to them, but they were all being generated by what I call not-for-profit government-funded agencies. They weren't being, they weren't examples of the commercial sector at work. I think that's going to take a lot of time to land. Great. Thank you very much, Adrian, for this. Um, so I guess we will have to move on to Q&A from the floor and also from our online audience. Uh, I do get one excellent question here. Um, 
So the question, this is from online. Everyone is talking about the digital arts and arts tech these days. Resources are always limited. As a leader in the arts industry, how would you allocate funding for this new era and balance the growth of both traditional and digital arts? So I guess that the, the last part is the, the key. So are all the fundings going into arts tech? What about the, the traditionals? So um, any, any <laughs> of you would like to pick up this question? Hmm. 네, 그럼 제가 먼저 yes. 대답을 하겠습니다. 아까 뭐 저희가 처음에 말씀을 드렸다시피 이제 한국에서도 꼭 기술을 활용해야 뭐 지원을 받을 수 있는 것이냐 전통적인 뭐 연극이나 무용이나 이런 것들은 그러면 지원을 지원해서 제외되는 것이냐 뭐 이런 질의들을 예술가 분들께서 하신다고 말씀을 드렸는데 그런 상황은 아니고요 지금 저희가 전통적으로 그 컨템포러리한 동시대 뭐 연극 무용 음악 전통 미술 뭐 이런 분야에 계속해서 지원 재정적인 지원도 하고 있고 사실 여러 가지 지원들은 하고 있습니다 근데 이런 그 어떤 어쨌든 지금 시대가 그 디지털 기술로 전환을 할 수밖에 없는 어쩌면 전환을 할 수밖에 없는 그런 시대이기 때문에 그리고 이제 예술가들 입장에서는 이제 저희가 봤을 때는 그 처음에 뭔가 기술을 시도하고 활용하고 싶은데 어쨌든 비용적인 측면이 큰 부분도 있고 그래서 이제 그런 부분들을 좀 완화시켜주는 정도라고 생각을 해주시면 좋을 것 같고요. 다만 이제 어쨌든 정부 정책적으로 좀 많은 좀 지원 사업들이 최근에 몇년 사이에 좀 이루어지고 있긴 합니다. 네, 이상입니다. Uh, let me just uh, quickly add to what Ms. Lee has said. I think for us, uh, it's the same too. We want to support both forms. Uh, we still have many uh, applications for the, the, the uh, physical art forms. Uh, but uh, it, it's interesting that uh, when we see these applications, we also see possibilities for more audiences to be engaged online. The two are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they add uh, to audiences and uh, in fact uh, they can give different ways uh, stages of engagement after uh, after the show physically perhaps you can further engage online so we've been pushing uh, the the thinking on this so in fact uh, in the arts council when we see a proposal with possibility for digital offerings we actually ask whether we can give that delta funding would you like to do more uh, we can support you that way. And uh, I think our artists then begin to see possibilities. The other point I just want to add is that, uh, as I mentioned, um, actually the funding is not always government funding. I mean, arts councils, I think, across the world have that function of supporting through taxpayers' money. But actually, if you're able to activate the tech community, uh, is what we call diversifying support. There's, they want to come in because it's exciting to them. And uh, if they see possibilities, they themselves will be your tech partners and they can bring to market. So the in the adoption phase, that is where the great commercial uh, uh, potential is. And I think this is not uh, new to many other sectors, you know, in pharmaceutical and in engineering. So why not the arts? So in the early stages of incubation and creation, the Arts Council has to come in very much uh, to facilitate, to support. But beyond a point, it just takes off because uh, in adoption and going to market, I think you will find that uh, you don't have to fund like this and there'll be new monies that are put onto the table. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great point. Um, Adrian? Um, I, I agree. Um, I agree absolutely with that point. And just to riff off it a bit, I think this whole area of Createch, which we're seeing you know, unfold at the speed of sound, and I'm sure that's true everywhere else in Hong Kong and Singapore, you're getting a closer adjacency. And I think it's completely in line with what Rosa was just saying between artists and tech sectors and that collision of skills and talents is very, very promising. And I think what this might speed up is I've often felt, and I, I use as an argument for public funding of arts and culture, that it is like research and development in the broader creative industries. So we really embrace that now in Australia. It's not arts over here. We see arts as fundamental to the investment in a broader creative sector. And we see it in the transfer of skills, of designs and production people and talent. Uh, and I think we're also now seeing that in the digital environment, that 
what we think of as artists have extraordinarily dynamic skills to to bring to the broader design sectors. So I think as as many things digitally, that's just going to speed up speed up that kind of transaction between the two sectors. Great, wonderful. Let's go to the floor, shall we? Uh, anyone in the audience would like to? Yeah, hello. <laughs> Thank you, first of all, to all the panelists. It was a very fruitful discussion panel, I think. I guess um, like from my own takeaway is that there are several, maybe three pillars in which technology can underpin the future of arts and cultural development. That is one, to enhance artistic creation and then artistic delivery, for, for example, in IP protection uh, or blockchain and smart contracts. And then the third one is properly to um, broaden inclusion and accessibility through technology and then ultimately to engage new audiences. Um, but then because you guys actually brought up a really, you know, something that's relevant to my question, and that is private sector's involvement, because, um, you know, the industry and the private sector is always moving faster than policy. Um, and I think it would be useful to also frame arts and cultural development and under the wider kind of framework of tech innovation as a society as a whole. You know, for example, Korea's uh, digital new deal and then Singapore's um, emphasis on innovation and stuff like that. And so private sector and tech innovation have always kind of moved faster in financial sectors or other um, areas. But then, you know, do you see, you know, with um, your policy support, does that actually um, encourage more private-public partnerships and does it galvanize private sector's involvement in the arts sector more? For example, Rosa, you mentioned um, how, you know, public funding is actually more useful in the incubation stage, but then how do you make sure that commercial success kind of follows and how long does that transition actually takes? You know, that's my question. Thank you. I guess I'll just uh, go first then. Um, well, I, I think one is uh, to acknowledge that the Arts Council does not have all the answers. You know, we do what we do best, which is that we know artistic merit, we understand artist psyche. Uh, so in Singapore, what we do is uh, we have other agencies who are very good at working with the private sector. So we learn to work with the Intellectual Property Rights Office. So we have uh, the, that to help us with thinking through what is the meaning of uh, protecting uh, intellectual property created by the uh, artists, uh, what are the standards, and so on to adopt. Uh, we also have what we call economic enterprises, uh, which have got incentive schemes to uh, activate partnerships. We've got our land and infrastructure agencies, which talk the language that the commercial malls understand, which is that if you do something, you get something back in return. I mean, I, I think you are not talking about bleeding hearts only here. It's not sustain. We talk about sustainability, right? Corporate. Uh, CSR, corporate social responsibility, is one track. Uh, people give because they love the arts. But I think the smart thing for the arts sector to do to be sustainable in the long run is to be uh, to be responsive to the business community's objectives. So when when uh, um, a mall owner or a property owner needs to have more uh, you know built up area and so on, can they support the arts? We have begun to talk to them also about uh, perhaps uh, technology infrastructure. Perhaps you can support. Uh, putting in the, the, the bells and whistles for, for tech-enabled arts. So these are ways in which uh, we are trying to unlock uh, uh, private support. And there's a whole regime which I think that Singapore and Hong Kong share those advantages, which is that we do have strong financial sector. So we're beginning also to reach out to our, our finance agencies to say, how can you actually incentivize investments? So I think if we, we understand that in, in, in the arts, we need to have partners uh, to, uh, and for our system, the policy partners, right, to incentivize private sector. I think that's another area of uh, of thinking that we would probably have in the in the years ahead to to, to think through. But I'll I'll let uh, the others share the insights. 그 한국에서는 이제 사실 프라이빗 섹터 같은 경우에는 그 현대라든가 현대자동차라든가 어떤 그런 대기업 들 중심으로 해서 그뭐 미디어 아티스트라던가 뭐 이제 이런 뭐 랩을 그 재단에서 마련을 하고 실제로 기술 전문가랑 예술가랑 같이 협업하는 프로그램들을 제공해 주고 이걸 그 본인들의 어떤 뭐 현대자동차라면요 그런 영업소에서 
이렇게 쇼잉도 하고 전시도 하고 이제 이런 것들이 좀 활발하게 사실은 지금 현재는 진행을 하고 있습니다. 그리고 다른 뭐 SK 같은 대기업들도 좀 그렇게 하고 있고요. 그리고 어 이제 또한 가지 저희 또좀 말씀드리고 싶은 거는 이제 최근에 메타버스라고 해서 그 이제 그 부분에 대한 또 지원이나 그리고 민간 기업에서도 그 부분에 대해서 굉장히 관심들이 많고 그러면서 이제 또 컨텐츠를 또 민간 기업에서는 요구를 하고 있습니다. 그래서 그 예술가들하고 함께 어떤 식으로의 컨텐츠를 만들 것이냐 이제 이런 부분들도 굉장히 같이 협업하는 분위기고요. 그 기술과 관련된 예술 활동에 대해서 이제 공적인 지원도 있지만 그리고 저희 같은 한국문화예술위원회도 있지만 이제 저희 한국에서는 콘텐츠진흥원이라고 해서 또그 산업적으로 뭐 영화나 드라마나 웹툰이나 또 이렇게 지원하는 또 공적인 영역들이 별도로 있습니다. 또그 분야에서 또 엔터테인먼트 회사들이 같이 또 사업을 추진하고 있는 그러한 부분들도 있습니다. 그래서 굉장히 좀 다양하고 활발하게 많이 어 지금은 좀 활동을 하고 있는 것 같습니다. 네. Great. And Adrian? Kingsley, I think we need another hour to do justice to that <laughs> terrific question. I've noted down those three pillars, and I think I'm going to exploit that IP in a future speech. It's a very, very nice way of framing. It. So thank you for the question. Look, in very broad terms, the commercial sector or the private sector has always been ahead of, let's say, the public sector in exploitation of of artistic value. And I could go back, you know, over the centuries and see how, how, how that has played out. And that is playing out again now. It is the tension that I think we're all dealing with. It's just playing out at the speed of sound or more because digital is just so much faster to deal with and more promiscuous in a way. And, and I'm not, I'm saying this in quite a positive and excited way. But if you think of the commercial sector, their, their main motivation is to make profit. We invest in arts and culture to create value. I'm not being oversimplistic, but there's a tension between those two things. Of course, commercial enterprises create all sorts of value. And of course, subsidized artists create all sorts of profit as well. But on the whole, as an arts council, we believe in creating public value, public money for public value. And that tension between the profit motive and how you create broader public value, I think is one that plays out over and over again. It's not something we should be afraid of. But the point I was trying to make is how do you regulate it? So again, a very clear example that discoverability in this country, in Australia, is now becoming a real issue. We have got very sophisticated, almost monopolized digital distribution channels and they're run by algorithms. So how do you ensure in Australia that Australian artists and Australian content is readily discoverable on some of those big distribution systems? As an arts council, I'm very interested in that. The people running those big distribution systems are much more interested in finding the algorithm that gets more and more people, their business models to get more and more people subscribing. So. That's not different to a publishing pop proposition in the 20th century or how you exploit Giuseppe Verdi's operas in the 19th century. It's just happening much faster. And to regulate it, to take the questioner's point, regulation is always behind what, what the private market is doing. So I think we're just starting to come to grips with that. But I think it's very important we do come to grips with it because we all know that in investing in arts and culture, we're investing in a public good as well as a creative good. Thank you, Adrian. I think we're just coming to grips uh, some of the very key questions. And particularly, I, I, I thought these questions on monopolizations of culture is something very um, prominent in, in these questions of arts and technology, especially a lot of the creations rely on collaborations between public and private sector. So how can we still uh, close guard artistic autonomy in uh, in this landscape? So I think this is a wonderful question to end on. Um, 
we do not have more time for discussion. So thank you very much again, Mrs. Rosa Daniel, Ms. Lee Yoon-hee, and Mr. Adrian Collette for such stimulation, simulating discussions this evening. So I'll pass the mic back to the floor.